Hey t -heads, this is Don from Mayleaf. In this video, I'm gonna be giving you the 10 things that you need to be looking out for when selecting your Gongfu clay teapots. Although some of these points will apply to teaware suited for other styles of brewing, for example, Japanese teaware or Korean teaware, but my attention here is on Gongfu clay teaware. Now, I often get asked the question, why don't we have more clay teapots on our website? And the simple answer to that is just like with tea, we spend a lot of time curating the selection that we think is the pinnacle out there for tea heads like you. And so we purchase, because they don't give them away for free, not like with tea, we purchase a whole range of teapots. These are just six that have arrived in, or oh five, sorry, these are just five that have arrived in recently. And so what I'll do is working with my colleagues, we'll go out and try and find potters and we'll find um, places to buy uh, teapots and then we'll get sent lots and lots and lots of pictures and prices. And then I'll look through them and I'll select some shapes and some, some pictures that sort of, um, sort of tickle my fancy, then we'll buy them, we'll get them in, and we'll test them against these 10 uh, factors which I'm gonna be talking to you about today. And only if they pass those will they appear on the website. So you can be sure that if they're on the Mayleaf website, then they've been vetted. Um, and usually over sort of a two week to, to one month um, period, they've been vetted um, against these 10 factors. But I wanted to go through these factors with you um, so that you can, uh, apply them to whatever teapots you are looking for. So let's start. The first four are specification ones. The first one is which type of clay are you looking to purchase? Now I've done a whole series of videos about different clays and their suitability to different tea types. And that's gonna be the real deciding factor. In other words, which kind of teas <clears throat> are you really wanting to brew in clay and, and which Therefore, which clay is more likely to be your candidate? And there are some clays which are better for like all-star uh, teas. In other words, they, they suit lots of teas and there are some which are more speci specific to certain tea types. Everything in front of me here is Yixing Zerni Zersha. So Zersha, purple clay. Zerni is a particular type. It's actually this sort of brown purple color and from Yixing. So a very classic clay that a lot of people are looking for. As I said, if you wanna sort of dive deeper into the different types of clay, I'll put a link in the description below or several links in the description below for you to go <clears throat> and dive into that rabbit hole. So that's the first point, type of clay. You might want Dweni, you might want Nishing, you might want Chaozhou, et cetera. The second point um, is the capacity. How much water? does the, the pot take? Now, I tend to set an upper limit for my Gongfu pots of 180 mil. And this is gonna be um, the, um, something that's a preference that's determined by how many people you're looking to brew for. If you're looking for sort of solo brewing, then sort of anything between sort of, I would say 70 to 150, even 180 mil is okay, because you know, you can you can have a relatively large Gongdao Bay and you can have 180 mil and just, you know, keep sipping. I think that anything above 180 mil, anything above 200 mil is starting to get out of the solo brewing uh, zone because you're gonna have to be using a lot of leaf. Uh, if you go down to sort of 120 mil, 150 mil, then um, it means you're using less leaf to get the same sort of richness of brew. And of course you can go down to 70 mil, but it's very unusual for, to get, you know, pots sort of under 100 mil for Zerni Zersha this style of clay is much more suited to slightly larger pots. So normally you're getting sort of the 150 to 180 mil up to 200 mil. I think these are all under 180 mil. So if you're looking to brew in groups, like two, four people, then again, 150, 180 is great. Um, if you're looking for more than that, then you might be looking for over 200, but I would recommend 180 or below. The third point here, is the style of production. <clears throat> and generally there are three types. There's slip cast, which means you've got a mold and they're injecting clay, which has been thinned down. So it's more liquidy. They're injecting that into the mold. They're letting it set, they're taking it off and then they're still working it. So it's still a lot of um, skill to, to, to sort of then shape that and work that into your final pot. 
The second option is half handmade, where you're taking pre-made molds and you are using clay, so solid clay, which they work, they bash down and they apply to those molds to create predefined shapes. And that is, you know, usually, you know, to make some sort of uniformity in capacity, uniformity within a series of T-Ware, but essentially it's handmade. We call it half handmade because there is some use of predefined shapes. The last and most expensive is fully handmade where you're literally taking a master potter in front of a wheel with a solid bit of clay and they're working it from their memory into a shape. And obviously you're gonna get much more individual sort of variation between the pots. There's gonna be variation in terms of capacity. There's gonna be variation in terms of, you know, in small things in terms of the shape, slight differences. You might even start to see a little bit more sort of working of the clay. You might visually be able to see more working of the clay as well. Um, and uh, some people like that. Some people prefer it to be a little, to, to see a little bit less of that working on the clay. But fully handmade is obviously the most expensive. Slipcast is obviously the cheapest and half handmade is in between. These are all half handmade pots. And generally I think that, that is a, a happy medium. You're still getting that attention to detail and you're using the solid clay that is, when I say solid, I mean, it's not been thinned down. To, to make it suitable for sort of um, um, putting into the, the slip cast. Um, and you, so you're still getting that handmade feel, but you're getting some uniformity. The clay quality for slip cast is generally going to be lower. I don't want to make hard and fast rules because I'm sure there are some very high quality slip cast pots out there with good clay, but because they have to thin it down, um, they, they, there may be the addition of other additives um, and so overall, the quality of clay is more likely to be lower quality compared with half handmade and fully handmade. Obviously, for a master potter to sit down and fully hand make a pot, they're not going to be using some shabby clay. They're going to be using a very high quality clay. <clears throat> so your, your probability of finding a higher quality clay increases as you move to half handmade and increases further as you move to fully handmade. So that's the third point, what style, and that is going to be um, determined a lot by whether or not you want individuality in the variations of the pot. You know, as I said, the quality of the clay is more likely to be um, high quality as you move to half handmade and handmade, but predominantly it's going to be determined upon the fourth factor, which is price. We have to put that in, of course. What is the price of the pot? Can you afford it? Now, whenever we're selecting pots, I will obviously look at what the price point is. <clears throat> and, you know, if I think, wow, that is a, just a stunning looking pot, I'll still probably buy it in just to check it out. And it will have to like perform like on next level on all of the 10 factors, on all of the other nine factors for me to justify the, 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 you know, the price of it. We are no longer, I don't think we're gonna be getting the Junda aged Zerni pot in anymore simply because the price keeps on going up. And whilst it is <clears throat> a spectacular pot in terms of performance, um, you know, it's starting to eke its way out of that acceptability range for me in terms of price. So those are the four fact, practical factors or specification factors. You've got which type of clay, you've got capacity, you've got the production style, slip cast, half handmade or fully handmade, and then you've got price. So then we get them in, we buy them, and then we move on to our next three factors, which are much more sensorial, much more about look and feel. And the first one is, of course, what does it look like? You know, does do you like the shape of the pot? So let's look at these pots here. You can see this uh, shape here, this sort of more dumpling shape, a little bit rounded. Uh, we're not gonna be talking about the functionality of the shape. We'll talk about that later. We're literally talking about does it please your eye? Is it something that looks good? And I would say that you should um, try to let things settle a little bit. You know, sometimes you might look at a clay and just sort of instinctively, uh, a pot, and you might instinctively go, oh, I like that and I don't like that. A lot of times you'll find that, you know, as you sort of look at it, sometimes pots will come in and out of favor. So I've got this one here, which is much flatter, much sort of, um, it's an interesting shape actually. And in a way it sort of looks simple, but the simplicity of it 
is really, really uh, something that I really like about it and why I selected it. Um, you can see this one here. Got like little legs, like little nipple legs or feet. And it's got a much smaller little uh, grip here. But you've got a beautiful sort of organic flowing shape to this one and that spot has got uh, the spout has got a nice little curve to it these spouts are much more straight tends to be better for pouring i'll find but we'll talk about that later as i said what we're just focusing on here is the just simply whether or not the sh whether or not the shape pleases your eye and also the color of the clay whether or not the color of the clay pleases your eye see i my first um glance at this when I saw pictures of was that it's sort of got a really um, interesting like rough almost um, um, I don't know like doesn't look like an expensive shape to me but I I like the the sort of originality of the shape and I like its sort of very rustic feel to it but then the look the the, the color of that clay doesn't really appeal to me compared with this sort of richer colored clay here which i hope you can see clearly in that lens and last one here a bit more of a classic shape sort of a lantern shape to it um and uh so yeah color and just the line the silhouette is it something that pleases you oftentimes people talk about whether or not the uh, top of the where the lid sits the rim let's call it that that would be the best way to describe it and the top of the spout and the top of the handle um, people like it to have a level quality so this one doesn't um, in fact i don't think any of these do and i have you may have seen a very old video of me selecting pots and I say, oh, that's a, something that I really like. But I've, I move less and less towards that. I don't really mind that side of things. If there's, okay, this is quite large. Um, all of these will have some rock, maybe this one. Yeah, that one's much more solid. But as I said, I just don't really, I don't really mind so much. As long as I can balance the lids like that, which for me is, is a factor which I like, is being able to balance the lid, then I'm okay. Let's see, this one wasn't very, this one's a little bit, yeah, it's a bit impractical, but it's okay. Let's go through them all. Yeah, it's okay. Yep, it's okay. Yeah, that's fine. So just so that after you've brewed your tea, you've poured it, you can basically um, take the lid off and allow excess steam to dissipate. Okay, so that's the, f the fifth of our factors is just the look of it. The sixth is very closely related, it's the feel of it. The feel of the clay and oftentimes I like to close my eyes on this because it just sort of accentuates the sort of sense of it. How does it feel? What's the weight like in your hands? How does the clay feel? This clay feels very lovely. It's, it's got a little texture to it but it's overall smooth. This one has more texture to it um, and you there will be Websites you can go and visit that talk about whether or not texture means it's a high quality clay if there's bumps on it I think you've got to be very careful trying to sort of apply these sort of simplistic rules to things um, It's better to test the clay just by taste and we'll do that a bit later But just how does it feel the, the quality of the clay the weight in the hands? Sometimes you can see a picture of a pot um, and this is one of the downsides if you're not doing what we're doing is that we buy it in and then if we don't like the feel then you know obviously we don't uh, you know buy more in but if you're spending your money on a pot you might not you probably won't get the chance to do this but oftentimes you see a pot it looks good the color may be nice the clay may may feel nice but when you get it in your hands 
there's something that just doesn't feel right. It might feel a bit too light. It might feel, in the case of this, very scratchy. This one has a sort of scratchy quality and you could probably see that in the actual clay itself, that it has a sort of, has a much more matte. And look, if I do that, you're gonna see marks on it, right? Um, try and get this to focus automatically. Can you see that? Let's try and bring it in. Are you gonna focus? Are you gonna focus? Come on. You can do it. You can do it. Find it. There you go. See what I mean? It's kind of got a scratchy quality to it. So I was very disappointed when I got this pot, when I saw it. It's like, ugh, compare that to, you know, this one here. That one's not gonna mark up so much. And it just does, it just feels, feels rough. So pick up the pot, feel it, touch the clay. Is it something that pleases you? This is personal, although you can, you start to learn a little bit, like I, I'm not sure that the quality of that clay is gonna be very good in terms of function, but you know, it is mostly an aesthetic thing. All right, um, the last aesthetic point or the last sensorial point is sort of aspects of the quality of how it was made. So we talked about the, the, the look of it in terms of the, the shape, the silhouette. We've talked about it in terms of the feel in the hands and the texture of it. But now just examining the pot, looking at it, seeing the production quality. Do you start to see, um, is, it, is it really scratched up, for example? Sometimes you get pots which have a lot of scratch marks. And I have to say, sometimes with fully handmade, you see a lot, you, you can see more of the working um, of the, of the potter because you know there's more working involved. So again, this is a personal preference. Some people like to see marks. It makes it feel like individual a little bit, especially I find with Japanese tea where you, you, you tend to have more of an acceptance of blemishes and marks because it sort of feels like this is, this is real, this is handmade. Um, but things like the, the fitting of the lid, you know, is it gonna rattle too much? This one doesn't. Um, this one rattles a bit more, but it's still perfectly within acceptability range for me. This one, again, acceptable. This one's very tight. And this one is very tight. Another way that you can do it, obviously not if you're in a shop, right? But you can put your finger on the hole here and blow through the spout and it should lift the, the, the lid up. So all of these, I think, will be good. Yep. If you find that air is leaking out, not a good sign, right? Yep. Uh, this one I can't because this one has the hole. And can you see? The hole here is, is hidden underneath the handle. So there's no way for me to get in there. It's just kind of annoying and something we'll talk about as well a bit later. The other thing is like just checking like the, the sound. Like, again, I don't want people to get too fixated on this because ultimately the quality of the clay is gonna be tested when you test it brewing. But like hearing the sound, it should, it should have a, a bright metallic sort of sound to it. It's okay. All right, it's got a little ring to it. This one I think is great. I can hear more of a metallic sound. You can hear it when I, when I put this on. This one too, yeah. It's got a nice sound to it. This one, however, can you hear? It sounds a bit more clunky. Again, I think that the quality of the clay on that is not that great. Same with this one. But as long as it has a decent enough sort of ring to it, 
then I would say that it passes. Obviously, you can get very, very pernickety about that. And, you know, what does that mean? Well, it's it's a combination of the quality of the clay or the type of clay, um, sort of uh, the, the, the composition of the clay, but it's also about how high it's been fired as well. I'm not an expert, but I make the assumption that higher firing makes it harder and therefore more metallic in terms of its ring. But, you know, you can dive further into that. There are plenty of forums about that, I'm sure. All right, so we've done the four specification ones, and we've done three which are just simply on look and feel. Now we move to what I think is the most important ones, which is function how it functions, because there's no point getting a good priced, lovely, fully handmade pot that has a metallic ring and has a great shape, etc., 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 for you in terms of visuals, but doesn't perform very well. So I'd like to split this up into three, three um, sections. The first is the functionality of the shape. How functional is that shape? So what I look for is a few things. I look for, well, this is a perfect example. I personally don't like this top. Now, I see it a lot and I know it's fashionable, but I find it's too slippy. I find it far too slippery compared with a pot, um, a, a top like this. So the handle, I mean, I did purchase this one in because I wanted to test it, but for me, this fails on that side of it. It's Yes, fine, it's like, it's workable, but it just, it's a bit annoying. Uh, it just feels a bit like it might drop out of my hands and obviously you're spending money on a pot, you don't want it to break. So um, this is an example. Is the shape, you might like the shape visually, but is it functional? That hole hiding under there, yeah, I'm, I'm not really somebody who covers the hole in order to stop the, the flow of tea, but, you might be, so that might annoy you. Another thing to look for is the, which is really important to me, how big the opening is. Um, so I think that this is gonna be a problem, this pot here, because for me to put tea in here is gonna be awkward. Even if I have a nice scoop, if it's large tea, and I'm gonna be using Shang Pua, um, speaking of which, I'm just gonna brew up some tea. If I'm using Shang Pua with straggly leaves, that's gonna be annoying. It's gonna flow out, it's gonna fall out. So whilst this two curve shape is actually really lovely in terms of look, it might not be functionally practical compared with this, which I just love. If you see it's wet inside, it's because I have rinsed them all. Um, I love this. I love the practicality of this pot. It may not have a sort of, ooh, what's that funky shape of this one? But I really love the shape. I think it's great, low profile, interesting, and sort of simple but stylish. But that, I can basically put my whole hand in here. <laughs> that sells a lot for me. Um, these ones, okay, a bit small. This one, again. Okay, it's not just putting leaves in, it's also cleaning. You know, cleaning pots that have a small, that's the wrong way around. Cleaning pots that have a small opening is annoying. You know, getting your hands in, trying to make sure that it, all the leaves come out, it can be annoying. Um, what else? Um, the functionality of the shape is also gonna be dependent upon what type of tea you are brewing. And I've done a whole video about shape of teaware and and how that affects brewing of different teas. So I'll stick a link in the description below. So that's something to, to factor in as well. Do you want something where the leaves can grow upwards and outwards, or do you want, uh, depends on which tea, type of tea you're brewing. Uh, you can dive further into that. But all of these shapes are okay for me. Um, in terms of brewing multiple different styles, this one is definitely my favorite. That will cover all bases for me and I love that large, large opening there. So functionality of shape, very, very important. Uh, the ninth factor is the functionality of the pore. And that is related to shape, um, but it's not just about shape. So this is about sort of 
how does it feel in the hands when you are pouring and what is the speed of pour? Um, one thing to look out for is the filter. Oh, this is gonna be hard, but hopefully you can see that that's a flat filter. It's just holes in there um, compared with this one here, which is a ball filter. Now, you may have heard that ball filters, well, let's talk about them. Ball filters tend to get clogged less. You can see there's many more holes in this compared with, compared with this one, which only has four holes. That's actually very, very small. Let's look at another one. Yeah, this has more holes in it. This has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven holes. So, you know, that's something that you need to look out for. If it's got fewer holes, it's gonna more likely be blocked by leaves, right? Because all it takes is a couple of leaves covering a couple of the holes and you've lost 50% of your pore ability. Also, the, the ball filters tend to have more holes and get blocked even less. But some people say that the ball uh, filters you have to watch out because they tend to, the, the actual filters tend to be made by different factories that just specialize in ball filters. And so oftentimes it's used with a cheaper clay. Um, that might be something that is important to you or not. I would say that what I always ask is if it's ball filtered, is it made by the same factory with the same clay or is it purchased in? As long as it's made by the same factory with the same clay, then that's fine. Um, even if it's purchased in, you're still getting most of the, you know, effect of the clay from the body of the clay. So I don't know if that makes a big, big difference to things. I don't think it does basically, but it's something to look out for. I don't mind having um, flat. Most of the Yixing, I think all of these are, will be flat, but I do look for that seven hole. Four hole is not really cutting it. Um, right, I brewed this up. Sorry, I've made uh, this kettle hot because I want to make a very strong brew of pua and we'll talk about that for the last the last um, point but I want to brew it up now I've got like some 2022 Pasha it's a big bag of Maocha here so I'm putting a lot of leaf in and I'm just going to pour boiling water over it and I'm gonna let that brew for long. Because I wanna really test the clay out. So this is something that we'll do for the last point. So um, just back on this, on, this, on this ninth point here, the functionality of the teaware in terms of its uh, pour, right? So you want to have the filter, which is not going to get clogged easily, and you want good speed of pour. So I'm going to put some water in here. I think this is one of the smaller ones. So we want the same amount of water. So I'm going to pour, put the water in here, make a bit of a mess. But I've got a towel here. Okay. So uh, you could do a stopwatch. In fact, I'll see if I can put a timer on when I am uh, editing this, but we want a good fast speed of pour. Ready? Go. And we also want to feel the balance of the pour. So I've done a video about how to hold your teapot. This is how I like to hold the teapot. This has a really lovely balance. Sometimes you find um, shapes that are a bit top heavy, uh, or sorry, a bit like to the, to the spout heavy and they're a bit annoying because they're always flipping. They're, you feel like they're always gonna uh, turn more than you want them to. So that was a good speed pour for me. Let's just take the same amount of water and test out other ones. So I'll do this a lot of times when I get a, a, a new teapot in. The feel on this is a little bit bottom heavy. It feels like I'm having to prop it up a little bit more on this finger. Let's check out the pour. That's slower. That's a slower pour. Remember, fewer holes, smaller spout. 
slower pour. This one's going to be, I think, a lightning pour. It's ball filter and it's got a big spout. Let's see if I'm right. Oh, the feel on this is not nice. Scratchy on the fingers and really, really heavy. Really, really heavy, thick clay, not nice. Would not like to pour this, it hurts me. But look at the speed, boom, Gen like That is the fastest of the pours, not surprising. Next one is this little, little fella. Nice feel, I like this in terms of feel. Strange, isn't it? Because you'd think that the weight of this would, would pull it down, but the balance is good the pour is going to be slower. And why do you want a fast pour? Because it messes with your infusion times if you've got a really slow pour. So if you were wanting to infuse a tea for say 25 seconds um, and then the pour on it is 15, 20 seconds, well, when do you pour off? You know, you check this one. Not great, not great and slow. In terms of preference for pour, this one, just standout winner. Really good balance, fast pour. I think it was the second fastest after this one here. So really good in terms of balance and pour. Um, but yeah, if you've got a 25 second brew in mind and your pour is 20 seconds, then what? Do you start pouring after just five seconds? Well. It's a very difficult one. Some people say, oh yeah, you should just brew it. Like you should just like factor in 10 seconds. Let's say it's a 10 second pour. Just minus that from your brewer, brewing time. So if you're brewing for 20 seconds, then minus 10 seconds, start pouring after 10 seconds. And that way, by the time the last drop of tea comes out, that's been a 20 second brew. Yeah, maybe, but I think that that's not really that accurate because while you're pouring, the brew is gonna be affected. You're gonna have less water in there while you're pouring. There's gonna be less extraction happening. So actually, I think it's more sort of halfway. In other words, my sort of general rule nowadays is, let's say I wanted to do a 20 second brew and my pour is 10 seconds. I will probably take that 10 seconds and divide it in half. So I'll sort of pour maybe five seconds before the end of the brewing time. So 15 seconds. And yes, it's gonna take 10 seconds to pour, but I, I think that that's a little bit more representative of what you're looking for. And you know what? As you have your pot, you'll feel it out. It will you know, be something that's instinctive to you. So I don't want people to get too caught up in like counting seconds too much, but it certainly is true that if you have a pour like this one here, which is like maybe 15, 20 seconds, and you wanna do a flash infusion of a tea, well, you can't really, <laughs> you know, you're, you're forced to like pour the water and pour it out and it's still gonna be, you know, a, a longer brew than you probably wanted. So balance, speed of pour, and the filter. That's the ninth thing, ninth point here is the functionality of the pour, balance, speed, and the filter. And last, but very, very important, is the effect that the clay has on your tea. And as I said before, this is gonna be dependent upon which type of tea you're planning to brew. Um, I've got a very, very, very hardcore strong brew here of Pasha Sheng Gushu 2022. This is gonna be astringent and bitter. And so what I wanna do is figure out how these clays soften it. And the reason why I've picked this is because generally Yixing clay, one of the most important, you know, teas for it to brew is Sheng Pua and Sheng Pua tends to have the most amount of astringency and bitterness. Therefore, that's gonna be my first test tea, but I will certainly test it against other teas as well, just to see whether or not there's any sort of mismatches in terms of clay, whether or not the clay has a weird reaction to maybe Sheng Pua or maybe other tea types. So, you know, it's not just one. I'll do this with, with lots of different tea types. I'll brew forgotten brews of white teas. I'll brew forgotten brews of Shupua like this, and then I'll see how the clay reacts. Okay, so we're gonna put these in front of me here. So this is the last of your 10, the, the, the functionality of the clay. 
and I've got too many cups here. Right, so this is gonna be my neutral. Hasn't touched anything. And all I'm gonna do here is try to be relatively even about how much tea I'm pouring in. And the effect of the clay will happen just by tea interacting with clay. And for those of you who don't believe me, test this yourself. You do not need to brew the tea in the clay. The clay has other effects on brewing, like maintaining temperature, etc., etc. But in terms of the effect that the clay has on softening, rounding, changing the flavor profile of your tea, you can do this experiment and it is instant. I could literally have poured this off after five, 10 seconds and I should notice the effect. Okay, so here we go. There's my very, very strong brew. Now I'm gonna um, try to keep this in order. So I'm gonna pour in here. Little drip on that. That's the other thing I'd look, look out for is, does, is it a bit drippy, <laughs> the pour? Really like the pour on that one. Pretty good in terms of accuracy there. This is a bit of a big spout. Is okay. Color of the liquors, I'm, you can't really see them, but what I will tell you is that they all look pretty similar, to be honest with you. I was gonna say that one looks a bit lighter, but that is because there's less in there. Okay, so let me taste this extra strong brew. I'll wake you up. Um, yeah, it's a high quality tea. Um, so I still really enjoy it. And in fact, I do kind of get a kick out of these, these ridiculously long brews, but it is bitter and drying. Um, right, so let's move through these. Strangely more bitter. And I know people can say, well, you know, you're, you're tasting in sequence, so your mouth is reacting, you know, to the previous one and this one, but I'm pretty good at doing this now, A, B, and this, and it tends to be consistent. Similar, maybe a bit thicker, but not much change in terms of the bitterness. Ooh, softened remarkably. And added thickness, and has added more of a transformation to juiciness than the original. So really liking the clay functionality on this one. This one's all right. No, actually, no, it's not all right. This one actually made it taste a bit more bitter. Let me just go back to this one. Yeah. I don't like the clay on that. This one, this is the high ringing metallic one. Good, really good attenuation on that one. That's a good clay. So these two are my favorite in terms of clay so far. Let's check this one. Oh, 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 no. These two no's, these two yeses. Okay, I, I, okay, this clay. Wow. Super drying super bitter. See, the thing is that that one's just as bitter, but somehow is less like aggressive. So this is why the, the functionality of the clay is, is, is like, it's chalk and cheese between them. And you can really, really just like, that is such a, like an important experiment to do. It's so fundamental. And it's so hard for people. I feel really sorry for people who are making purchases on clay teaware without being able to do this beforehand because you might love the shape. You might love the way that it looks and the texture and everything, the story behind it. But when you try it against the tea, it just doesn't perform. And of course, that is the most important part here is that it's a high performing 
uh, teapot. Let's go through them one last time. Oh, oh. oh it's amazing the difference. Oh. Oh, I think that's my, that's the worst. That's the worst. And it's weird because the clay doesn't look that bad on this one. But that is not, not doing it. Now I will, as I said, test other tea types against the clays. So, you know, it might be that it performs better on other tea types, but I always think like, what's the primary use case gonna be for like, you know, this tea where it's gonna be Shang Pua and Shu Pua. For Chao Zhou, it's gonna be uh, Dan Song teas, etc. So I'll test those first. Oh my, my stomach is doing somersaults, super strong tea. So those are your 10 factors. Let's go through them quickly one last time. You've got the specification ones, which are the type of clay, the capacity, the style of production, and the price. Then you've got the three that are more personal and more aesthetic. You've got the, the, sh the shape, wh whether or not you like the silhouette, whether or not you like you know the stylings of the pot. Then you've got the feel, how it feels in your hands, the weight, the, the, the texture, the texture of the clay, etc. And then you've got the, pr the, the, the production quality. Is it something that you feel has that sense of quality? You can do that little ring test in terms of the, you know, the sound of the clay and look at the, look at whether or not there's any markings on it, you know, look at, looking at um, the, uh, sh the fit of the lid, doing that little blow test, um, you know, these kinds of things, just to, to sort of look at the quality of the production. And then we move into the final three, which is functionality. First of all, <clears throat> the functionality of the shape. Is it gonna be something that you can load easily? Is it gonna be something that you can clean uh, easily? Does it suit, does the shape suit the tea types that you are looking to brew? Uh, the ninth factor is the functionality of the pour, looking at the filter, looking at the speed of pour, and looking at the balance as you pour, how it feels in terms of center of gravity, and also looking at whether or not it dribbles, or et cetera, like, you know, how it, how it sort of performs during the pour and at the end of the pour. And the last is the functionality of the clay. Brew a very strong brew of the tea that you want to uh, um, primarily brew in, in that pot and test it. And as I said, I know that that's near impossible when you're purchasing online, which is why I'm so fanatical about making sure that I do all of these tests before I'll put anything on our website. I hope that this has been helpful for those of you dipping their toes and buying your first teapot or those who already have an extensive teaware collection. I should also say that when I'm doing this sampling process, I think that it's really, really great to sit with a pot. For example, I really like this teapot right now. I think it's just, I'm, I'm loving it. Um, and it may well be on the website by the time you watch this video, but I also need to sit with it. I need to test other tea types, but also just leaving it on the shelf and seeing whether or not it's something that you pick up regularly. There's a sort of je ne sais quoi quality about teaware that you've also got to factor in. It might be that you really like it during the test, but then for some reason you're not picking it up that often. And that is something that I also uh, look for. Anyway, lots of different factors for you to uh, think about, but try to apply them to your selections and I hope that you're gonna get more winners and less studs. That's it, tea heads. Check out our other videos, taste our teas wherever you're in the world by browsing mayleaf.com and come visit us if you're ever in London. Other than that, I'm Don from Mayleaf. Thank you for being a part of the revelation of true tea. Stay away from those tea bags. Keep drinking the good stuff in the best tea wear possible and spread the word because nobody deserves bad tea. Bye.